Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we have this really cool Seiko automatic from I think the mid 1970s. And uh, I got this thing off of eBay. As you can see, it's in pretty rough shape, not super bad, but a little bit neglected, perhaps um, was not running according to the to the listing, at least uh, not consistently. And um, as you can see, this is a Sea Lion M77. That's the that's the model name, I guess. Um, also, as you can see, it's missing the crown. It's just uh, not there at all. But in the package came this little tube, and the crown is inside. Now, it does not have a stem attached to it, the winding stem that would normally be there. Uh, maybe it's still in the case, or maybe it's missing altogether. We're going to have to try to find that out. Shaking it, yeah, it doesn't seem to really want to run. And you can see the date looks like it's off a little bit too. Now it could be because it's getting ready to turn over or it could just be off. I'm gonna use this rubber ball to take the back off of this watch. I really like the design on this and it has a really nice movement too. This one is a, the movements have numbers, you know, to differentiate them from each other. This one's an 8305C, which you can see there, it's an automatic. And that rotor right there is the automatic winding rotor that actually winds the watch up when you uh, move your hand around. Let's see if I can get this thing running a little bit. No, it doesn't quite want to get going, but it also probably doesn't have much of a wind in it because it's been sitting on my bench for a while. And, um, and again, it doesn't have a winding stem, so I can't really wind it up manually. I'll start by taking off the uh, case screws for this watch. And then we can take the movement out of the case. I really love the dial on these. They have kind of a cool silver blue. This one's not in perfect shape, but it's in pretty good shape and it looks nice on the wrist. You can see that pattern on there. We'll start by removing the hands. Looks like the hour hand's a little stubborn, but it, <clears throat> it'll come off. And we'll put the hands in this little plastic case for safe keep, safekeeping. It has a like a membrane that sort of suspends the hands so that they can't move around, but also they uh, they stay protected. And now that means that we can take off the dial. Ooh, look what happened! It started running after I took the hands off. Interesting. Perhaps there was some corrosion or something maybe preventing the watch from turning over. Let's see how it does on the time graph for while we have it out. Yeah, that's not too bad. It's running a little fast, but uh, otherwise it looks like it's okay. Yeah, so maybe we have a runner here after all, and uh, I can just do this, just give this thing a service. We do have to replace the winding stem. And uh, maybe the crystal too, it didn't look like it was in such good shape, but you know, a good cleanup and a few extra parts and I might have a nice watch on my hands here. I did actually buy this watch for a specific reason. For those of you who've been watching my channel for a while, this watch might look a little familiar. I've done one similar to this before. Um, and uh, after I finished it, I gave it to a friend of mine who I thought would like the color and the, the design and he was just getting into uh, to watches. And so I figured he'd, you know, like a watch like this. And, um, but right after I sent it off to him, um, I got a message from my dad's best friend, my late father's best friend, his name's Mikey. And he's a friend of mine too, of course. And he's been in my life for a long time. And, uh, and he said, Hey, I really like that watch that you did on the channel. Um, you know, any chance you still have it around? And I had to tell him, no, I, I've, I've already sent that one off. But without telling him, I decided that I would start searching for one to uh, restore for him. Little did I know <laughs> that these are very difficult to find. I had a search on eBay for over a year looking for this. And this is the first one that came up and I, I got it. But I'm like, wow, you know, I, I, I had gotten that other one kind of by happenstance and um, I didn't realize that they were this difficult to find, but I was really excited. Oh yeah, there's definitely some corrosion, some gunk build up here. So we'll have to, uh, we'll have to address that. But yeah, I was really excited when I saw it and uh, wow, it actually looks like it's running pretty well here. Um, and I picked it up to restore for, for Mikey. He's, uh, 
yeah, like I said, he's been part of my life for, for a really long time. And when my father passed away, it was, it was hard on both of us. And we got closer after that. He doesn't live in the same state I do anymore, but uh, we still talk every once in a while. And when he's in town, we'll go grab a burger at our favorite burger place. And he's just a great guy. So I thought, you know what? Let's make Mikey a watch. Mikey's also the kind of guy that <laughs> he's got a lot of good stories, some of them including about my dad, but some of them are about him. My, my favorite one, in fact, there's a little Easter egg uh, in the middle part of all of my videos that's dedicated to Mikey, although he, he didn't know it for a long time. <laughs> but uh, he's, he's actually a Patreon supporter of the channel, which I thought was really, really cool of him. And, um, you know, so he had his, his name on there as his email address or whatever. And so his name would come up on the, the Patreon part in the middle of the video where I think my patrons and the names go by, by the way, I'm just taking off this kind of major bridge. This one, um, is a bridge that kind of goes across all of the train of wheels plus the barrel. It's, it's kind of a lot, but so far the assembly looks like it's going fine. No rust or anything major, but anyway, um, he asked me once, he said, Hey, I didn't, I noticed my name wasn't on the, on the list anymore. And I said, yeah, yeah, it is. And he said, no, he said, I didn't see it for the last couple of videos. I said, Oh, it's there. You'll have to look a little closer. And, uh, <laughs> and that's because for, I don't know, forever, for over I don't know, a year and a half or something, I had been changing his name on there. Uh, but he didn't notice it. And what I changed it to <laughs> is a joke that, well, I knew he would appreciate it and I knew my dad would too, which is my dad was an auto mechanic uh, for his career. He was also just a total car nut. And he, uh, for a stretch of time, was part of the pit crew on a race team, a local one here in, in Washington where I live. And his, the carburetor shop that he worked at sponsored the the uh, car and you know so there's the, the the race car team and all the mechanics and stuff like that well Mikey was sort of a a satellite part of that team he would help out and and pitch in and he was kind of you know a supporter of the team and he'd be around and you know um and and everybody loved him you know one of the nicest guys and stuff so you know no problem but he wanted to drive the race car and so he bugged my dad and the owner of the team and, and the guy who ran the team for a long time. Like, Come on, just let me, you know, I want, I want to ride, I want to drive the race car. I really want to drive it. It's an oval track scenario. And eventually they said, okay, okay, Mikey, like you've helped out a bunch, you know, you can, you can take a few laps in the race car. So he's all oh, great. So he jumped in the race car and, you know, took it nice and easy for a little bit to get going and then he said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to go for it and pr promptly crashed into the wall. Now he was fine. <laughs> the car was less fine, but those type of cars, those type of race cars are the kind that you kind of rebuild every week because they get bumped around and crash sometimes. So the team had to spend extra time, I guess, uh, you know, putting the car back together. Um, but again, it, it ended up being that, that everybody was okay. But my dad at least told me the story that, uh, the next time Mikey came in to visit him at the carburetor shop, they had a, a gift for him <laughs> and they had gotten him a, like a coffee mug with his new nickname on it, Wally. <laughs> and that's what they, they called him Wally for quite a while. And, you know, it was a joke and, and they were teasing him forever about it. But I remember that story. My dad would call him Wally every once in a while still, <clears throat> even years after that. And, uh, so I changed his his name in the credits on here to Wally, and he he went back and looked and found it, and uh, he said it actually brought it brought a tear to his eye, uh, <laughs> which if you know Mikey is uh, that that's kind of how he rolls. He's uh, he wears his emotions on his sleeve. Anyway, I love you, Mikey, and uh, this watch is for you. So when I'm done with it, I'm going to be sending it to you, and uh, I hope you can wear it for a good long time. Uh, at any rate, we've got this thing basically completely taken apart now. As you can see, everything looks okay. Um, I'm actually pleasantly surprised by this. Uh, the fact that the listing said it was only running intermittently, um, you know, it makes you worried. Also, the fact that it was missing parts straight away, the the winding stem just being straight up missing is, is a little bit concerning. It kind of makes you wonder what else is going on in there. But 
um overall no everything's here and it looks okay i mean i I do have to get a whining stem as i mentioned and a few other things but it's all here and uh so i think i'm going to be able to to turn this this ebay lemon into some lemonade so let's uh, get these parts put away so usually i put them right into the cleaning basket but this time i'm doing it a little bit different put it in the tray because the cleaning basket's full i actually had another project that was already cleaning so sometimes you put things things in this uh and that dust cover. Now I need to take off the bezel that goes around the crystal. So I've got a tool that's specially made to do that from four sides there, as you can see. So there's the main case, and then here's the bezel and the crystal, which I should be able to, yes, just simply push out. That bezel squeezes around the outside edge of the crystal and makes the watch waterproof. And as I mentioned, I'm not really happy with the crystal. I'll probably look to try to find a new one of those. But while I do, I can go ahead and uh, get this watch all cleaned up, and that means that it goes into my L&R Mastermatic watch cleaning machine from probably the 1930s or 40s, I would guess. And uh, as you can see, it sits in this uh, jar with a cleaning solution and goes back and forth and gets all cleaned up. Now, I did mention the Patreon just a few minutes ago, and I'll mention it again here. This is how I support the channel, and uh, if you like what I do here, you like my videos, um, you can head over to patreon.com slash wristwatchrevival. And uh, if you do, that will put you um, on my page where you can support me. You can do any amount. Uh, it's per video. So like if I don't put up a video, you don't get charged anything. I, I have it set up that way on purpose. It just makes me feel better. I, a lot of creators do it monthly. So no matter what you do, you get the same. But I prefer it this way. That way it's a nice, clean transaction. If I don't put out anything for a while, you're not going to get charged. Um, and you can change it, quit, come back, raise your level, lower your level, whatever you want anytime, and you get some perks. Thanks to everybody who uh, who supports me over there. Uh, not only the watch cleaning machine needs to go, though, I also need to clean the case and, uh, you know, the bezel, the case back and all that kind of stuff. And for that, we use this, which is an ultrasonic cleaner. You can see the waves, not well, I guess the waves, yeah, on the top of the water there. And when I turn it off, they go away. It sends these, you know, ultrasonic waves through the water and the cleaning solution in the water. Ooh, this is actually really dirty. Wow, that was way dirtier than I thought. Uh, anyway, and it creates these little cavitation bubbles on the surface of it that kind of act as a way to push off any contaminants that might be on it without using any abrasion, right? There's no... Uh, you know, sandpaper or anything like that here. So with everything all cleaned up now, we can take a look at how everything looks when it's done. And look at that little constellation of parts, beautiful. And yeah, everything looks like it's good to go. This is a heavily jeweled movement. I'll show you a few of those when we get to the movement getting put back together. For now though, um, we're, we're gonna start off with the mainspring and not knowing how long the mainspring that was in there was in there, I'm going to replace it with a brand new one, and I found this one. It's funny, it says it's from Pulsar, but uh, you can see it says Seiko here, so I suppose that's the right thing. And uh, this is actually the easy way to do it, too, if you're going to start working on watches at home, which, by the way, I do highly recommend this hobby. I, you know, it is really, really fun, especially if you like to get your hands on stuff. And if you like to uh, restore things, it really scratches that itch, but you don't need to have like a full garage or lay down on the cold cement, you know, bench pressing a transmission up into place for anybody that's been in that spot before. You'll know what I'm talking about. This is a lot easier. You're sitting at your desk (laughs) and uh, you know, yeah, sure. It can be just as frustrating when a spring flies away, but at least it doesn't hurt. Um, At any rate, Um, if you are looking to get into this hobby, you know, it's often easier to just replace the mainspring than it is to rewind the old one in. Now it's not as cost effective. It doesn't keep the original part. So you do have to consider that and buying a set of mainspring winders, which is a specialized tool used just to take mainsprings that have been unwound, wind them back up and safely put them back in the barrel is a good investment. And it's something that you'd want to have eventually, but you know, until you save up enough for it. As long as you're working on watch movements that you can still get the mainsprings for, which is most of them, you can just buy a new one. You know, they're not that expensive. They range from like eight bucks to like, sure. I mean, I guess if you get like some old Rolex or something, they're a hundred bucks or whatever. But, you know, 
most of them are like, call it eight to $20, something in that range. And it's also just a good thing to replace anyway. You know, again, unless you're going for like uh, all original parts or something like that, or you know that it's in good working condition, it's good to replace it. And so that's what I did here. And with that, I can put the mainspring barrel in place. And now I can start to reassemble <clears throat> the rest of the movement. And of course, that means that, you know, these wheels will go into place including that one, which is the escape wheel. And there's actually quite a few wheels that need to go into place on this movement. That's the fourth wheel right there. <clears throat> when they number the wheels, the escape wheel is the last wheel. It, it would be the fifth, but it, they just call it the escape wheel. And then there's a the fourth, third, and then they call it the second or center wheel and then the they don't call it the first wheel but the barrel that that part the big shiny silver one that I put the mainspring into the mainspring barrel that's the first wheel that's that's number one and what those wheels do is they turn the ratio of a very slowly turning mainspring barrel into the very 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 fast turning escape wheel at the bottom each wheel changes the ratio to be faster and faster and faster now I'm gonna use a special lubricant slash cleaner called Lubetta to clean this reversing wheel. These you can't take apart. I, I, I can't like pry this in half or whatever to, to clean out inside. And they require cleaning and lubrication. And so that part can be a little bit tricky. So what I like to do is use that Lubetta, which is a cleaning agent, but it leaves behind a, like a thin layer of lubrication rather than evaporating off completely. Okay, there's a couple of intermediate wheels. Now, I'm putting together kind of two parts at once because it's all covered up by those two big plates that go over them. This part over here is actually, including the reversing wheel there, is for the automatic winding works. So this watch is an automatic, and this is like a dedicated hardcore automatic also, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But this watch is meant to be worn like every day, and then it will wind itself up. So as you can see, this is a little tiny bridge that I can put on and it only has two jewels on top. The jewels uh, are those red, those deep, beautiful red color. They're synthetic rubies. They're made in a lab, but they are the same chemical makeup as a ruby, which I think is called corundum. Corbunda, I can't. I think it's corundum, which is a um, which is a gem that when it has a certain mineral or whatever dispersed in it, looks red and it's a ruby. But if it has a different one, then it's blue and it's a sapphire. But they're the same underneath. the The reason that we use these in a watch actually isn't for the looks, even though they do look really cool. By the way, I'm putting on this bridge and it's got one, two, three, four. Five, it has six, I believe, six different pivots that it needs to line up with. And in fact, it looks like I've knocked one of the pivots out of its hole. When that happens, it's okay. That sometimes this takes a few times to, to get it right. Just, you gotta, this is where patience really kicks in. You take it off, you realign all the pivots again, and then you give it another shot. And we'll see if I can get it this time. But yeah, the reason that we use the jewels in the manufacturer, did I get it? Yeah, that's, there we go. The reason is, is because they're very, very resilient to wear. They're hard. They're very hard, in fact. They're nine on the same, you know, on the, on the scale, it's called the Mo scale, where diamonds are 10. These things are a nine. And so when you combine that with the steel pivots, that's the, the kind of axle from those wheels, and some lubrication, it makes for a very perfect setup where the bearing, which is what the jewel is, is harder than the stainless steel. And then the lubrication in between means that it runs very, very smoothly with very little wear. And for something like a wristwatch, that's perfect. If regularly serviced, meaning that you take your watch in to get it cleaned and oiled, they will run forever. I mean, I definitely longer than a human lifetime with no issues. I mean, they, you know, the wear that you get when they're properly lubricated and the watch is running well is absolutely minimal. 
I'm sure that there is some theoretical end game where that would happen. But usually when pivots get worn out, or even if a jewel were to get scored by a pivot from rubbing for years and years and years, it'll eventually work down the uh, the jewel material, is usually because there's no lubricant at all. Like the, the oil's dried up long ago, and people just keep wearing the watch, and it'll eventually wear that part down. Okay, we can flip the watch over now and start putting in the, uh, the keyless works. This is a fairly complicated setup on the other side. And the reason for that is that this watch has multiple features that not all watches have. First, it has a calendar function. Um, so a lot of watches have that, but this one, this one does as well. So that needs to be put into place. But on top of it, it also has a quick set date function. So when you pick up your watch, if you haven't worn it for a while and you want the date to be correct, on older or less refined movements, you have to actually turn the hands and make the little hour and minute hands spin around for 24 hours and then it'll click over to the next day. But if you got seven or eight or 15 days to go, you gotta sit there and spin that thing forever. And it, and it you know, you get bored, it, your finger starts to hurt. Like it, it really is annoying to have to do that. It's so annoying, in fact, that if you look, many people just never set the date. They're just like, whatever. You know, I, it tells the time, and I don't use, use it for the date, so that's fine. But they came up with a quick set mechanism. So, you know, when you pull the crown out on your watch, if it's pushed all the way in and you turn it, it'll wind the watch. And then if you pull it out, that's where you can set the hands. Well, this one actually has a setting in between. So you pull it out a little bit. And it's got a quick set date so that you can turn it and it'll just turn the date part where it goes like day, 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 that quickly. So you can just pick up the watch and get it to the date you want right away. Then you can pull it out all the way, the crown, and then set the time, push it back in, put it on your wrist, and off you go. Now, these little springs are very tricky because they have to be sort of held in parallel against some of these parts that push, but they have to just sit there for now because the covers can't go on yet until I put on these other parts. So it's a little bit annoying because now I need to set up this spring pushing down on that bar, which is called the yoke. Or I think some people call it a spring bar or something like that. But where I learned this stuff, which by the way was here on YouTube, I should mention, um, the person who was teaching, as it were, uh, again, via YouTube, uh, his name's Mark Lovick, and he has a channel on here called the Watch Repair Channel. And uh, he called it the yoke, and so that's what I call it. By the way, Mark is awesome, and you should definitely check out his channel. And if you are looking to get into the hobby, uh, he has an excellent website called watchfix.com that has lessons that you can purchase that are I took it. I took, I've taken every class he's put out. That, that's basically where I learned is by watching his videos here on YouTube and doing his tutorials on, on watch fix. And, uh, they're excellent. Like he laid them out really, really well. And, uh, I learned a ton of extra from watching them. And, and by the way, that's just, I'm, I don't like, I don't have a deal with him or anything. Like I paid for them. <clears throat> And uh, I just send people over whenever I can because I just think he did such a good job. And frankly, because I'm grateful that he decided to start the channel when he did. Okay, let's take a look at this stem situation. I found a stem on eBay that uh, says it's for this movement. So let's see if it'll fit into the crown for starters. Most watch stems of this size, uh, they have a tap. That's the, the threading that's on it. This one would be a tap nine. Sometimes it's tap 10, but it's almost always tap nine. And let's see if it'll work. Okay, I got a little bit too much of that blue grease here, so I do need to kind of clean up the mess a little, but that, that seemed to work okay. All right, so let's flip this movement back over and get the pallet fork in place now. This is another place where patience really does pay off you will know for sure when that pallet fork is sitting correctly and you do not wanna screw down 
that pallet fork bridge until you know for sure that it is. And that's why I'm using this, that clear stick there to help hold it down. It's kind of like using your other hand because once you get it lined up, you want to keep it there. If I let go of that and I accidentally bump my desk or breathe too hard, it might move that out of position. And then when I go to screw this down, I can snap the pivot. Okay, I can put a little wind into the watch here. And this is another way to double check that the pellet fork is sitting correctly. It takes effectively no effort at all to move it from side to side. All right, and that means we can put the balance back in. This is my favorite part of the whole process, or it's, a, it's in the Mount Rushmore of best parts of watchmaking, let's put it that way. Eh? That is when it actually starts. So let's see if we can't, oh, 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 oh. There we go, it's, it's going a little slow, but we haven't put in any lubrication yet, and it, it does look like it's kicking up a little bit as well. But, you know, getting the pivots oiled and getting everything oiled up is absolutely crucial to making the watch run, not only for a long time, but make it run really well. And this is how we do it. We use what's called an oiler, which is just a, a metal stick with a special front end to kind of capture the oil or a special tip. And I do this, you can see on the microscope. And I actually recommend to anybody who wants to get into to watchmaking to buy a microscope. Um, I actually have a link in the show notes to the one I got off of Amazon, but any, you know, kind of student level microscope will do just fine. And look how close it lets you get in so that you can actually see what you're doing. Here I'm removing the Diashock jewel. This is just the brand name of the type of jewel that they use here, or sorry, not jewel, spring. Um, and I'm using two sets of tiny tweezers to do it. And uh, I can do this because I'm on the microscope. I'm gonna use some Rotico to pick up this extraordinarily tiny, flimsy, jumpy little spring. Those things are very easy to lose. And then that leaves two parts left. That one right there, which is a uh, cap jewel. And then below it is the jewel setting, and that'll come out with the Rotico as well. And now we've got all three parts out. And I need to clean up the cap jewel and the jewel setting. The spring doesn't really need to be clean. And they get a little sticky sometimes. And to do that, I'm gonna use something called one dip. It's just a solvent. You can use lighter fluid or you can use IPA, isopropyl alcohol, but it doesn't work quite as well but it, it'll do the trick. And I'm gonna use a piece of pegwood to manually clean the surface of that jewel because you want it to be absolutely, perfectly, spotlessly clean. And while those are sitting in there, I'm gonna go ahead and move over and take out one of the other cap jewels. This is the other type. And this little uh, spring actually just moves off to the side. So what I can do is I can loosen it and then just move it. Oh, no, okay. Well, what I meant to say was that was supposed to just move off to the side. Instead, it actually came out of the setting. Now, that's okay, but it's just, they're such a pain to get back in, and they're really, really finicky. So I'm kind of bummed that I did that. I haven't actually done that in a little while. Um, but normally, I learned at some point that you can just leave that spring attached. So now I can move out the jewels and uh, clean up the other cap jewel as well. I'm just trying to be efficient here and do them simultaneously. So now what I'm gonna do is take a absolutely tiny droplet of that fine oil, the synthetic, and put it on the top of the cap jewel. Then I'm gonna take the setting and make a little sandwich out of it. And the capillary action will actually hold it in place and it will suspend that droplet of oil directly in the middle. So now when I put this down, do you see the oil? That little ring of oil in, this, in the middle there, that is what is gonna lubricate that part of the watch. And it suspends that oil right above the pivot. Now the spring needs to go back in again, as I mentioned, and the spring is what they call a shock protection system. So if you drop your watch, I'm not talking about electrical shock, we're talking about like, bang, it fell on the ground or off the table. The, this spring will actually flex and accommodate that axle in the middle, that pivot. And when it does, it is much less likely to break because the spring is meant to bend and the pivot isn't. Pretty simple. Okay, so now I'm gonna do the same. I'm gonna put that little tiny droplet of oil on the surface of this cap jewel and then gently, 
There we go. You can see that circle of oil once again, hovering above the, the pivot. And now, don't jump away. Please don't jump. Oh God, thank that. So, so far that's already good. And now I can gent, uh, this thing's making me really nervous. Come on, there we go. So once I get that part under the lip, it will hold that jewel in place securely. Now that we've got it all oiled up, let's put it on the time grapher and see what kind of results we got after some tweaking. Oh, very good. Solid amplitude at 231 and zero beat error. And it's within one second a day. So really, really nice. I mentioned that this watch has 30 joules in it. That's a lot. Normally, um, you know, like a, a nice Swiss movement will have 17. That's kind of the, the baseline. But this one has 30, which means basically they put a jewel on any friction surface they could get their hands on. <laughs> which is nice. It's, it's, it's a luxury, right? It makes things a little more resilient, run a little smoother. Maybe run a little longer, even if you don't take perfect care of it. Okay, now we can get back again to the other side of the movement. This one is the calendar side. So this is what's called the calendar jumper spring. It pushes up against the calendar jumper, which is what makes it kind of click into place, jump into place, if you will. But this little spring is a nasty little thing. Barely get it into place, and then you wanna get this cover on about as quick as you can, because that spring will jump on you, no problem. And you see, once again, I'm using one of those plastic pointers to keep things steady. It's my other hand. It does make using a screwdriver a little tricky, but it's all good. Okay, so now you can see the movement tick over there when it goes past midnight. And that means that we can go ahead and put the dial on. Now, before we do though, take a look at how the loom works on this. So these are the indices, which by the way is plural for index. So one of them is an index and it has luminous material, glow in the dark material. We just call it loom for short on watches. And the hands, I actually happen to know, are supposed to have loom on the bottom of them, but they don't. So see the luminous material actually points out. Normally it faces you, right? There's a index or a, you know, a marker on the dial and it will have glow in the dark material loom that points towards you, but these actually point out so that they can reflect off the inner part of the case. So what I'm gonna, the problem is, is that this loom is all worn out and it's dry and it's crusty and it's black and it's rotted out. So I need to remove the old loom before I can re-loom this, oh no. All right, well, one of those indexes just fell clean off the dial. So I used my peg wood there and I barely even had it started and this index came off. So it goes right here. So I'm gonna have to deal with that as well because I'm not gonna hand off this watch missing one of those. So let's get the loom going here first though because it does take a little while for the loom to dry because the way that we actually do this is we mix it up ourselves. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some of the luminous compound in this little jar and you can see it's just like a fine white powder at the beginning, but it will glow. It, they, you can buy stuff that glows in all different colors and blue and green and red and orange and all that stuff. And then all I, I'm gonna use is just a binder. It's a, you know, it's a clear material, a clear liquid I should say, that gives you something to suspend that luminous compound in and then that will evaporate and leave just the luminous compound behind. So we want just a little dot of this stuff in each of the indexes, or indices if you will, just like that. And that way it'll just sit in there and then it'll dry up and then when the light hits it, it'll charge up and then when it gets dark, theoretically it'll glow. I think this design is really cool. It's also kind of flawed <laughs> because the light has a hard time hitting things that aren't pointed at it. So you only get a little bit of glow out of it, but it's still cool and it looks cool in the case. So here's the hands and as I said before, I know from the other watch I did that these hands actually come from the factory with luminous compound on the bottom. It looks like somebody has scraped it off, but I'm gonna replace it. 
It's another good hint, right? That when you think about how companies and people design things, right? Especially like a watch, they're well thought out, right? So imagine if you made a watch that had glow in the dark indexes for each hour and you didn't put any glow in the dark material anywhere on the hands, <laughs> right? It, it, it would defeat the purpose. You would be able to only see theoretically what time it could be, which you probably can imagine that without having to have glow in the dark <laughs> indexes. So, you know, the fact that these have absolutely no luminous material on them at all is a very strong indicator, or it should tell you there's something wrong, like th they're supposed to have it on there. And there's nowhere to put it on the top side. So it actually has to go on the bottom. And again, I have the other model of this. So I happen to know. And take a look. That's what it looks like. I've got a little UV lamp that kind of shows it. It's kind of a green trending towards blue uh, in real life. But take a look. There you go. So those look good, all dried up. Now, the problem is we still have this one index that has fallen off. Uh, so let's take a look at how it was originally attached and then try to figure out what we can do. So on the microscope, you can see right where it was, um, looks like tack welded or soldered into place perhaps. And I'm not gonna be able to do that because now on the dial, if we heat it up, it'll probably melt or warp or deform it. So I'm gonna have to come up with a different way to re-adhere this index to it. And I think I'm gonna use epoxy for this because I can mix up epoxy and use one of my oilers, the oiling stick to apply a very small amount of it. And when it dries, it's really, really hard and it should hold. So let's use some quick epoxy, which just means that it, it cures, you know, more quickly than the regular epoxy, which takes like a day. This one takes about 10 minutes to cure to something decent. And then the rest of the day before it's like a hundred percent done. So my goal here after mixing the two epoxy materials together is to get the smallest amount I can, okay? So there's a little tiny bit and then we have to just try to get this thing lined up the best we can. Like that. All right, so we'll let that dry. That looked actually pretty good and while it does, I can get, I can pour my attention back into the case here. The first thing is that there is an old gasket on this and this was originally a rubber or nitrile gasket and look at it now. It looks like it's made of plastic, like hard plastic because it's so dried out and old. So we're gonna need to replace that gasket so that this watch, you know, so if Mikey takes it out in the rain or whatever, it's not gonna leak. So the way I do this is pretty simple. I take calipers and measure it. And then I've got a box of, uh, of gaskets of varying sizes, thicknesses and, and diameters. And I'll pick the one that matches up closely enough. I'll put it in this silicone cleaning slash coating case that I have. And then I can put the new gasket on, done deal. Now, the next thing we need to do is address this crystal situation. Now, the good news is I was able to find an authentic Seiko crystal, once again on eBay. Uh, that's where I get most of my parts. Um, and it looks like it fits perfectly, as hopefully it would, but you never know. Sometimes when you order stuff, you know, you don't know if it's exactly the right part or whatever, but this one does look like it. And then the other thing, though, is we need to press on the bezel, and that's something you can't really do with your hands. So we're going to use my Rober press. Rober is a brand out of... Um, France that makes these, these watchmakers presses. And I really like these because they screw down from the top rather than push down with your strength. And it allows you to make adjustments like this, right? So I can stop at any point, use my other two hands. I can push it down further. Once again, just make sure everything's lined up. And now there we go. I've got it pressed down into place. And I like that. I like being able to switch up, you know, what I'm doing with one hand and then make a little bit of an adjustment because you want everything to be lined up properly for something like this. And look at that brand spanking new crystal looks absolutely fantastic on this watch. And that means, of course, that we can put the dial back on as well. And it looks like the index is holding on very nicely too. So I'm happy about that. Now, the first thing we need to do since this is a calendar watch is to wind or set the hands forward right up until they switch over at midnight. Cause that's of course when the watch indicates that it's gone from one day to the next. And then 
that means that when I put the hands on the watch, I have to put them on at midnight because that's when I want the watch calendar to tick over. If the watch doesn't have a calendar, you can just put them on as long as they're on any hour lined up perfectly as a starting point, you're good to go. But on calendar watches, you actually have to think ahead a little bit. Okay, hour hand on, minute hand on, now the seconds hand can go on. Just a little gentle push to make sure that it's seated properly. And again, just checking it out to make sure that it, yeah, clicks over at midnight and it looks like it did. So that's good. And now we can go to uh, casing up this watch. We're almost done with it. The dial looks a little bit beat up when it's outside of the case because it has a little bit of uh, wear on it. But I'll tell you, when it's on your wrist and when it's in the watch case and stuff, it just looks awesome. Like it's it's got that cool sunburst thing. It's got that really neat color, that ice blue kind of color going with it. And now we can go ahead and put on the crown and stem. Although it looks like it's too long, though this is typical. Um because you have to trim down the stem, so we'll probably have to do that here. Although, look at this, this actually doesn't make sense at all. Look how long the stem is with no place to trim. Like that would go halfway through the watch movement. It doesn't go that far in. I'm thinking this is actually the wrong stem. So what I'm gonna do is continue with the build here and I'm gonna track down a proper stem but for now, I can go ahead and, and at least put the watch in the case as it's going to be. Because the watch can be in the case when I get the new stem and go to install it. So I'll leave that. And that means, of course, that the case clamps have to go in. These are case screws that hold the movement up to the case uh, the movement ring, which is that metal ring around the outside. I can also just make sure that everything's fitting and looking good um, while I track down this other stem. So this looks good. That's, that actually looks really good. I could even throw a strap on it. it. Looks like it's an 18 millimeter. I've got this little tool that helps you just quickly measure which size you need. I've got kind of a dark gray strap we'll try out for this. I, I like um, two different looks for this type of watch. I like a nice dark strap like this that looks kind of business mode. But I also like to put on like a, like a cool, colorful NATO strap on it. And that looks really nice too. So here it is. This is the stem that also says it was for this movement and I can tell right away that it looks different because it has a lot more thread, see, that I can trim down and a lot less stem. So even though that stem actually worked inside the movement, uh, it was not the correct one for this uh, model. So now I've got the right one, but see how far this one sticks out? That needs to be trimmed down. So I need to take up the gap between the case and where the crown meets the case. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure it using my calipers once again. And it looks like it's 4.25 millimeters that I need to take off. So now I can take that stem and put it into a pin vise. And now I can take my calipers that are at 4.25 and I'll just take a felt pen and mark out 4.25 millimeters. Now. I'm gonna leave myself a little wiggle room. Anybody who's ever done this, I can take these end cutters and cut pretty close to where I have that black mark. But as you can see, I left myself a little bit there. That's the measure cut, measure twice, cut once type mentality. If you cut or trim too much off, and I'm just gonna use a file to kind of flatten out the threads and to take off any burrs that might still be on there. Um, if you cut off too much, you can't use it because the crown will hit the edge of the case and it won't be able to fully engage the stem. So you have to just chuck it and do another one. And I don't want to do that. So I'd like to uh, get this project done and get it into Mikey's hands. Now that looks much, much better, but that was a test fit because before we can call it good, I need to do this. I need to use a little bit of Loctite on the threads. This is the softest Loctite. It won't hold it completely, you know, it doesn't freeze it in place or anything, but it will keep it so that it doesn't uh, let the crown back off of the, uh, of the stem itself. So now once again, I can replace the back and take a look at what we did. Really nice. And this crown, this is what I was gonna mention before, is comically small. 
This watch is very dedicated to being an automatic. It's basically the crown is only used to set the time and the date. You can technically wind it, but I don't know how anybody could get their fingers around that little tiny crown. So it's just gonna have to sit. And you're meant to wear the thing every single day. So there you go. There's a beautiful Seiko M77 for Mikey, one of my favorite people. Mikey, I love you, buddy. And I hope you enjoy the watch. If you enjoyed this video, you can find more content over on Instagram. I'm, I'm wristwatch underscore revival there. Make sure you look for the little check mark next to my name as uh, I want to make sure that it's actually me that you're dealing with. Uh, but I'd love it if you come and say hi over on Instagram. And uh, with that, thank you so much for hanging out and we'll see you next time.